Welcome to the Dr. Janine Show. I'm Dr. Janine Bowering, naturopathic doctor, and today's topic is secrets of what you need to know about vitamin D. So a couple of weeks ago, I had a special guest. We talked all about vitamin D. That was Dr. Ken Redcross. And today we are continuing that conversation about vitamin D, why it is so important for our overall body, our immune system, some of the symptoms of deficiency of vitamin D, and some of the ones that you may not have heard of yet. The benefits, of course, of taking vitamin D, some of the best food sources of vitamin D, and some tips as to how to increase your vitamin D status in your body. I'll also be discussing how and when to take vitamin D as a supplement, and we're going to be talking about weight loss and the correlation with the vitamin D deficiency with weight loss. Now, vitamin D is actually not a vitamin, it's actually a pro hormone, and it's great to know that on a hormonal level, Level, we have the ability with vitamin D to actually produce the vitamin D with the sun's help, of course, on our skin. And this has so many different functions in the body in terms of keeping us healthy. And this is where immunity becomes very important, but also that hormonal breakdown from cholesterol is important when we're talking about our vitamin D status. And all of our organ systems, whether it's the kidneys, the liver, they also have to be functioning optimally for us to get that proper amount of vitamin D from the sun. Now the problem with vitamin D when we're getting it from the sun, it really does depend on where we live and our latitude. So of course the most vitamin D that we'll get from the sun and our, our exposure to our skin is near the equator. The further north or south, uh, so as that latitude number is increasing on the globe, then we are getting less and less of that natural sunlight exposure, especially to the UVB. And it's the UVB that creates the vitamin D when it reacts with our skin. And the further north or south we are of that equator, and the higher that number of latitude, the less our body can actually make and produce its vitamin D on its own, and that's the vitamin D3. So what's interesting to note that in cultures that live far away from the equator, so when we think I think in Canada, I think of the Eskimos and the Inuit, what they had to rely on was vitamin D sources from the food. And the food that they would eat in a traditional diet would be things like whale fat and seal fat and walrus blubber, which of course, it's not something that I eat every day, but in you know their regular culture, if they have stuck to their regular cultural meals, then they are getting some vitamin D from the food. And unfortunately now, because our food is often shipped, and certainly to the northern uh, communities as well, food is shipped from elsewhere, there may be a high, high risk for a vitamin D deficiency because of course we're not getting it from the sun and from the exposure to the skin. So this is something to think about, especially if you live at a high latitude as we do here in Canada. We're at about sitting at about 43 here in Toronto, Ontario, 43 latitude. It's, it's much higher than the equator, which of course is zero. So anything above, I've heard San Francisco level and above. So if you take a look at the map and you're above that, that latitude line, you are at risk for that vitamin D deficiency. And especially when we're talking about the, you know, in certain seasons. So we're, we're gonna get to that in just a second, but it's the latitude and that zenith angle of the sun, which changes in the seasons, and that can cause that risk. And, you know, the question around the Inuit and having more of a likelihood to not be well, when we talk about the risk of, and this is something that was actually studied, they were at, very high risk of the H1N1 virus and because of their lack of the vitamin D from the diet when they switched to the standard American diet or the SAD diet because of that lack of vitamin D D3 and not eating their traditional foods from the sea, which would have provided some of that natural vitamin D. So when we talk about now some of the reasons, so these are six proven reasons that you may be vitamin D deficient. So some of these reasons, of course, would be, yes, lack of sunshine. So if you clearly do not go out in the sun, and especially in the summer months, that's when here in North America, we're going to get the best exposure to the rays of the sun. But in 
talking about, you know, not having that natural sun exposure on our skin if you just don't go outside. And most people that work or they're indoors most of the day, we're simply not getting that active, you know, making of that vitamin D on our skin. So this is a big factor. Another reason would be because of clothing. So we cover up and of course, the colder it gets, usually the more clothing that we wear. And in the winter, we know that we're not getting that, that proper UVB penetration into our skin so using even clothing a lot of people in different cultures as well they they use and are covered up with their traditional garments that they have covered up their skin and this is something that i i find so interesting that you know how are they getting that exposure and when i've traveled to several african countries it was really interesting that you know in their culture you would think they're outside and getting close to the equator getting so much natural sunlight every day it simply isn't the case everybody stays indoors air conditioned comfortable settings and simply they do not go outside so they are at high high risk especially with darker skin for those you know cultures that live close to the equator typically the skin is much darker and now there is that definite risk for having that vitamin D deficiency. So the use of sunscreen as well. So certainly we've heard and if please check out my whole other show all about the benefits of the sun that I have broken it down and it's really interesting to note in that show that I talked about the you know the misconception as to getting skin cancer and these misconception as to sun exposure and actually causing skin cancer when there is a lot of evidence that actually shows the opposite and the sun, the sun and natural exposure to sunlight has very protective effects for our immune system but also for our vitamin D production which we're talking about today so there's that the, you know there's a bit of a disconnect there in the literature and what some would have you believe that the sun is not healthy for you actually the opposite is true and I am a huge proponent of getting natural sunlight but when we use sunscreen of course we're blocking those UVA and UVB rays which we need to make that vitamin D so again setting ourselves up for that vitamin D deficiency now another reason which I touched upon a few seconds ago was because of our skin color. So, you know, myself having lighter skin, um, I would be considered probably the fair type and it would only take me about five to 10 minutes of that UVB exposure with that strong exposure in the sun of, of the noon time sun um, in the summertime to, to make my adequate amount of vitamin D for that next 24 hours. Hours and, and that's all that it would take. And I could make, and we'll get to the numbers in just a second, how many I use in that short amount of time. But as compared to someone with a darker skin, so for instance, the darkest skin being black, um, skin would take up to 90 minutes to create and have that exposure for 90 minutes in the sun to create that same level of international units of vitamin D. So it goes to show you that the darker your skin tone, the longer exposure you would need in the natural sunlight of that UVB. So when the, the sun is the strongest, usually around noon, and depending on where you live, then that, that would be, you know, what would be indicated. So most people I don't think are getting that level of sun exposure. And of course, exposing enough of the body to be able to get that. So really, you know, less than 15% of your body should be covered in those instances. And that means a little, you know, speedo <laughs> bathing suit for the guys or a tiny bikini for the women to be able to cover those the parts that you want to cover but the rest of your skin should be exposed so most people are not doing that certainly to get their D exposure every day now another reason would be dietary deficiencies so if you're simply not eating food so certainly the the further you are from the equator the more of uh, the the fish and you know mushrooms would be another source we're gonna to get to the whole list of the sources of vitamin D in a few moments so stay tuned for that. 
but you know it could be because you simply don't eat these foods in your diet that you may become deficient. So thanks for joining me today. Be sure to give me a big thumbs up. If you're new to my channel, please make sure that you subscribe and turn on your notifications by clicking that bell so that you always get my newest and latest uploads. If you've got questions and comments, I would love to hear from you. And even you know, live during the show, I can definitely get back to you and, and be you know typing in comments comments and things with our whole team here at the Dr. Janine Show. So please don't be shy. Please make sure that you chime in and, and if you're on YouTube, leave your questions and comments below. We do get back to everyone. And if you've got a future idea for a show as well, I would love to hear from you. So when we're talking again about vitamin D deficiency, there's different age groups and, you know, in terms of how much our body can actually produce. So the younger person actually produces much more vitamin D and that maybe has something to do with the ability to, you know, we need that extra boost of vitamin D for bone and teeth growth and to, because vitamin D maximizes our calcium getting into our, our bones and teeth. So a teen or a mid-teen to age 30, the maximum production of vitamin D with that natural sunlight exposure would be about 25,000 units at one time. So that's a huge number. And we'll keep that in mind when we get to supplementation because yeah, the, naturally the sun is making that much vitamin D in one sitting that you know we have to think about, are we actually getting enough? In age 30 to 60, so an adult, the maximum production would be about 15,000 units. And for someone who's 60 and above, about 8,000 units, the maximum amount that your skin would be able to make. So this is, becomes very important because as we age, certainly our natural production of that vitamin D declines. So there's all the more reason that we have to stay on top of our supplementation to make sure that we're getting enough and certainly getting as much natural sun exposure as possible to max out what our body can make on its own. So now I'm going to talk about the symptoms of vitamin D deficiency. So one of the first telltale signs of, of lack of vitamin D would be fatigue and just lack of overall energy. This is so, so common and certainly absolutely relatable to your vitamin D status. And this is something that can really help your overall energy by getting your vitamin D level where it needs to be. The next symptom would be muscle and bone pain. So if you suffer from muscle cramps and a lot of pain in the bones and just a lot of pain, it could be low back pain, it could be you know in your quads or after you work out that you just have a lot of sustained pain that does not revert on its own, this could be related to that vitamin D deficiency. Again, in the bones, if it's in the bones, it could have to do, of course, because vitamin D helps our calcium to get into our bones, it could be related to that vitamin D as well. Low mood, so seasonal affective disorder, certainly going into the colder, darker winter months here in Canada, this is a huge issue and it's something that is, I think, not talked enough about and certainly to be able to you know give a prescription for for low mood is one thing but what if it is just a vitamin D deficiency and something that is so treatable by you know getting our vitamin D status up and usually that means supplementation in the winter time if you live at our kind of latitude here in Canada that this could be such a simple fix and that's my whole message is that whenever we can do things naturally then that's definitely the the way that we would want to go Another one is weight gain. So a lot of people don't realize that vitamin D deficiency has a lot to do with our metabolism and our metabolic rate. So even weight gain can be related to a vitamin D deficiency. Hair loss is very common as well. And this is something that has been shared with me in the past from one of my patients. And she said, yeah, and she was worked in the hair industry. And she said, it's so common in the fall. In the fall is when your hair falls. And yeah, it makes sense from a vitamin D perspective because, and she said, yeah, all the clients that would come into the salon, yeah, everybody's hair was falling out in the fall. Well, that was that lack now of that natural vitamin D and the exposure to the sunlight going into our, our darker winters here in Canada, that that would definitely be a problem. And, and that would be a direct manifestation of that lack of vitamin D with the hair falling out. Another symptom would be frequent 
infection. So certainly we know the connection with vitamin D and our immune system. So make sure you check out our part one in which I spoke with Dr. Red Cross, an expert on vitamin D supplementation. And he was talking about, you know, viral infections and the pandemic and that those relationships. So that is something that's really, I hope you didn't miss that episode. So make sure that you check that out. But really important to know that yes, vitamin D status is very important for our overall immunity and keeping our body strong and especially for upper respiratory tract infections and there's numerous studies that have shown the effect of vitamin D deficiency and how that causes you to be at higher risk for not getting well especially in the upper respiratory tract. Another thing is leaky gut syndrome. So I will talk about this in a few moments uh, in terms of some of the research that has been done in, in with leaky gut. So GI distress and not having, you know, calm and great digestion can be related to a vitamin D deficiency as well because vitamin D has something to do with the tight junctions in our gut. And we know that leaky gut syndrome, there's a problem there. So that's really important in terms of vitamin D status and getting it where it needs to be. And also brain fog. So brain fog, if you have unclear thinking, have difficulty concentrating, that could also be related to the vitamin D deficiency. So now we'll talk about some of the benefits of vitamin D and what the literature and some of the studies have shown us in terms of our vitamin D status. And yes, we've talked about vitamin D and the immune system and there are vitamin D receptors on most of the cells in our body and on T helper cells and T helper cells help the immune system. And if our vitamin D status is low, it actually turns off our epigenetic switch on the genes to turn on our immune system. So to simplify that, when we have low vitamin D, that switch does not get turned on for our immunity and now we're suffering with that potential lack of that proper immune response to fight off whatever has come our way. Also vitamin D in the literature has shown that yes, with upper respiratory tract infections, which I, I mentioned is very important, that correlation to get our vitamin D status where it needs to be in order to fight off infections. But also when we talk about healthy bones and teeth, we know that vitamin D helps to ensure that that calcium is getting into our bones and is being properly absorbed for that proper structure of our bones and for strong teeth as well. And a study has also shown vitamin D in terms of the mental health and in this study what was discussed was the potential for vitamin D to be helpful for children especially with mental health issues and the study suggests that the role of vitamin D in the pathogenesis of mental disorders in childhood and in adolescence was investigated and, and they said in the study we've got to do more work on this because you know those correlations have been seen and it's something that's really really important to investigate so absolutely I mean vitamin D for status in children especially if we're covering them up and I see this all the time you know on the beach mom is putting slathering on a bunch of sunscreen and the hat and the glasses and not allowing for natural sunlight exposure and yes we have to be careful we don't want our children to burn but a little bit so the first 15 minutes is usually you know for some a very light-skinned child the first 15 minutes in the summertime is important to get that natural sun exposure to make that vitamin D and then you can put on the sunscreen after that and certainly prolonged exposure out in the sun is not healthy as well but you've got to find that healthy medium in terms of being able to make our own natural vitamin D from the sun with our skin. So now I'll discuss seven foods that are high in vitamin D. And the first is salmon. So a lot of the fish naturally have vitamin D, which is naturally occurring. So salmon is fantastic, as well as herring. Halibut would be another source. Sardines as well. So some people prefer the smaller fish because of toxicity issues. And certainly the longer a fish has been alive and the bigger it gets, it can potentially accumulate more toxins. So sardines is a great 
great choice for a lot of people because it's a smaller fish and less toxin accumulation. Mackerel as well. And shiitake mushrooms. So all mushrooms will have a little bit of vitamin D, and but this is D2, so it's not the same as the you know vitamin D3 that our, our skin makes. It's a vitamin D2. So yes, it will still help to improve your vitamin D status a little bit, but not quite as good as exposure to the sun. And the thing about mushrooms is that they are, if they are farmed or conventionally grown, typically they're grown in the dark. And if they're grown in the dark, they will not have that vitamin D level that they should. So one of my tips is to actually, if you purchase mushrooms, is to let them sit on the windowsill or wherever you can to get some natural sunlight exposure. So it'll help to increase that vitamin D in the mushrooms. And this is especially true for vegetarians. If you don't eat any of the, you know, the non-vegetarian sources of, of the vitamin D in the food, that this is very important that, you know, if you're eating and you use mushrooms. I know a lot of you make burgers and things with, with mushrooms, which is fantastic. Just to put the mushrooms in the sun, get some natural sunlight exposure, and that will help with the vitamin D just a little bit. As well as egg yolks, so naturally have some vitamin D, which is naturally occurring. But the question is always, well, how much can you actually get from food sources? Usually that vitamin D2 from food sources is more difficult for the body to utilize. And that's why I prefer, you know, the combination absolutely with the sunlight, but also with, you know, some of those food sources as well. So how do we increase our vitamin D3 status in the body? Well, one, the obvious, get more sunlight. But if we can't do that, then sometimes we definitely have to treat the vitamin D deficiency by taking a supplement. And we can rapidly treat the vitamin D deficiency with some simple ingredients. So certainly top of mind is a vitamin D supplement. And you want to look for a vitamin D3 supplement because this is the same type that our, our skin makes from the sun and it is more readily absorbed. Now one of the, my tips is to always take it with a healthy fat because vitamin D is, again, it's a hormone. It's a pro-hormone and it's fat soluble. So some of our vitamins like vitamin C and the B vitamins are water soluble. We flush them out very readily through our urine. Whereas vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, these are fat soluble which means we can actually store them in our fat cells. And this is to our advantage, but we don't want to ever take too, too much, but we want to take it with a healthy fat when we are, are ingesting our vitamin D to help to maximize that absorption of that vitamin D. And certain supplements actually come with fat within the supplement itself to help to maximize that absorption. So that's something you can take a look at. If you want links to supplements, you can take a look in the description below and you'll get that information there. Now another thing that actually helps with the absorption of vitamin D is magnesium and magnesium bisglycinate is the type that I take and as in our previous show where we talked all about the protective effects of magnesium, why magnesium is, is, and we have a huge deficiency issue with magnesium. We simply don't get it in our soils anymore, but it has a very protective effect when we take enough magnesium against EMF radiation. So those electromagnetic fields from our phones, from our computers, our televisions, everything that's plugged in basically around us has an EMF and has that radiation which potentially could have a negative effect on our body. So magnesium works like a natural calcium channel blocker, so helps to prevent that damage from EMFs. But vitamin D also helps to protect us from EMFs. And a study that was done on rats, and I know that some people will say, well, rats, you know, aren't the same as humans, but often they give us some great information. So what the study showed was that just one hour a day of EMF exposure to the rats resulted in a significant decrease in the immunoglobulins, which we can see here, but also it had an effect on the leukocytes and the lymphocytes and the other immune cells. And they found surprisingly that, or not surprisingly, that after, and that was just one hour of exposure, but then after two hours of exposure of the EMFs to the rats that it 
significantly increased these changes. So definitely the correlation was there. And what they did find was that the vitamin D supplementation in the EMF exposed rats reversed the results when compared to the non EMF exposed groups. So this is significant. And, you know, to think that we could do, again, something naturally, but we can't necessarily get away from that EMF exposure, but whatever we can do naturally to protect ourselves is of utmost importance. Now, another tip that I have is when you're taking your vitamin D is to also take it with DHA. So DHA, again, from the food sources that we talked about in terms of fish and the fats of, of fish and seals and whales and things that, you know, Northern cultures traditionally would be eating in their diet that has natural vitamin D within that food, but also contains DHA. So DHA is super important in terms of an omega-3 fatty acid to help to increase that absorption of that vitamin D. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that the relationship between vitamin D and the microbiome. So you know that I'm all about the microbiome and having that healthy gut ecology, and the microbiome is basically the balance between the good and the bad organisms that are naturally living in our gut. So we've got the good ones, the probiotics, and the bad ones, the not so good ones. But what has been shown is that exposure to UVB light helps to increase the diversity in the microbiome. Now, where I'm going with this is that healthy people tend to have a greater diversity of that microbiome. And the, the more diverse your microbiome, the better. And the study showed that by having that skin exposure, especially to the UVB light, helps to have that modulation to the healthy microbiome. So this was studied on healthy females, and they found that this, again, was the first study to show that humans with low vitamin D serum levels display an overt change in their intestinal microbiome in response to UVB skin exposure and increases the vitamin D levels, suggesting the existence of a novel skin gut access to which could be used to promote the healthy intestinal homeostasis. So yes, there is a correlation and you know, I've found it so fascinating and I'm looking more and more into this connection between the gut and our microbiome and that exposure to UV light. And it has been said that our microbiome actually gives off light. So imagine that we're, when people say you're lit from within, yeah, we are lit from within and that diversity in our microbiome, could that be the light that's actually fueling the vitamin D that we are ingesting and that we have internally? So something really interesting. I'm hoping that future studies are gonna be done on this to be able to really find that link and why it's so important that we connect all these things, not only our sun exposure, but helping to have that healthy microbiome as as well. Now, autoimmune disease. Now, we know that this is on the rise and there are actually vitamin D receptors in the tight junctions of our gut. So if you've heard me talk about autoimmunity before, that leaky gut syndrome definitely is of utmost importance that we help to tighten up those junctions again. And vit vitamin D has been proven to actually help with that tight junction uh, and that the tissue barrier in terms of being able to maintain that tight junction. So in this study, what the researchers found is that mounting evidence indicates that vitamin D and the vitamin D receptor play key roles in the pathogenesis of human disease and that in the tight junction complexes that this has a lot to do with treating defective tissue barriers that involve not just the gut, but also the skin, the lungs, the kidneys, and other organs. So, you know, again, further research Research needs to be done on this. This is just the beginning, I think, in terms of taking a good hard look at, you know, why the leaky gut is such an issue and what we can do. So vitamin D would be another one of those tools to help to maintain that healthy gut. So now we'll discuss vitamin D and weight loss. So yes, weight loss is something that, yeah, people struggle with. And what researchers have found is that high vitamin D levels, so having the right amount of vitamin D, 
is correlated to low leptin levels and increased adenopinectin. And this is important because that means basically a better body composition. And I'm going to do a whole show on leptin because that high leptin and leptin resistance has a lot to do with not having a very healthy body composition and it leads to more fat deposition, especially around the midsection, and which is often related to our cortisol levels as well. So there's this whole hormonal cascade that happens when our leptin levels are high and forms that resistance in the brain and the hypothalamus. So what we want to do is get our leptin down and it shows that when we have, you know, a sufficient amount of vitamin D that it helps to keep our leptin levels down. And again, it's tying in our circadian rhythms with our ability to tap into that sun's ability and the vitamin D to help to keep all of our hormones in check and in balance. Also with weight loss we're talking about and getting our vitamin D status on point has a lot to do again with decreasing our risk of diabetes and that connection now with the leptin resistance but also insulin resistance so what will happen first is that there's the leptin resistance and then we get into the insulin resistance and usually it's the leptin that was the first insult um, and and the brain not being able to to deal with that excess of leptin and then we get into insulin resistance as well so that we'll do a whole show on leptin i promise because it's so fascinating i think it's definitely missed in mainstream medicine and it's really the starting point we've got to get our leptin under control to be able to get you know the benefits of our wonderful system our body that works so well on its own so I always get a lot of questions. What is the best and what is maybe the worst time to take the vi our vitamin D? And I'd say that the worst time is probably to take it at nighttime. You don't wanna do that because it actually can have a negative impact on your melatonin levels. We know our melatonin is actually made in the morning, and but its secretion happens at nighttime when we're sleeping to help with sleep. And so we don't want to sort of alter or mess up that whole cascade of, of hormones, especially when we're wanting to get a good night's sleep. So I prefer that you are taking your vitamin D in the morning hours as close to, you know, usually between 10 and 12, when I think probably we would get some natural vitamin D exposure from the sun. And this is where it's leading me into my Dr. J9 Truth, which you know I like to share in every episode here of the Dr. Janine Show. And the Dr. J9 Truth for vitamin D is to make sure that you're getting in the sun to be able to turn on your body in order for your body to ultimately use that vitamin D. So whether you're taking it from a supplement, you wanna sort of turn on that switch to say, hey body, vitamin D, it's important and utilize it as to the best of your ability. So make sure you're getting, however you can, some natural sunlight exposure and do that on a daily basis. Even if it's cloud cover, please just do your best to get outside, especially in the early morning hours to activate all of that circadian rhythm and all the benefits of your vitamin D, whether you're getting it from a supplement, you're getting it some sources in your food, but also to make sure that you're maximizing that sun exposure on your skin. And this is, you know, there are... are issues with again the latitude so going back to that really quickly before we wrap up the latitude so there's something called the zenith angle of the sun and this is something that i started to really pay attention to in my own you know where we live and here in canada because of that that latitude that we're at we're at about 43 i believe new york is about 40 we're at 43 so anything really above 25 you're basically <laughs> not doing so well for your natural ability to get the vitamin D. And as we go in, as the seasons change and we go into our winter months, whereas in the middle of the summer, that zenith angle would have been a, a bigger angle. And that's why we get at noon, we get that great exposure of that natural vitamin D. But that zenith angle now is decreasing. And what you'll see is that now because of the angle of the sun and the way that it's hitting the, the earth, then we're not getting that great exposure of the UVA and the UVB. So this is why we are at risk now. And we basically don't get that UVB in our winter months here in Canada, even if you do go outside. So we're at a disadvantage. And this is where you've got to you know, supplement to make sure that you're getting enough in your 
your daily diet to account for and adjust for that zenith angle. Now certainly if you can have the ability, hopefully we're all going to be able to travel soon <laughs> if you have the ability to get close to the equator, at least for you know some time if you live at a northern or a very southern latitude to be able to get closer to the equator at, at those times uh, when you the zenith angle definitely has decreased then that's all the power to you because that will really help your vitamin d status not to mention your immune system and your circadian rhythm as well so thanks for watching today if this video has helped you to learn something new please give me a big thumbs up and hit that subscribe button i would love for you to be one of our subscribers Turn Turn on your notifications by clicking that bell as well so you always get my newest and latest uploads. If you've got questions and comments, leave them below. I would love to hear from you. If you've got an idea for a future video as well, that would be fantastic. And I will see you next time. So remember to always take care of your good health and do it naturally.